Kia ora koutou katoa, no mai, haramai, welcome to another Toi Caucus um, webinar on this lovely Friday morning. It's our regular occurrence to be in this space together. Um, before we get started, we'll just start with a karakia uh, to welcome everyone into this space. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te ponga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai, e hi ake ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihei mauri ora. Mm -hmm. So welcome again, welcome to our lovely um, co-facilitators. Today we're looking at part two of Trauma-Informed Sexual Violence Prevention and Education. I'll hand over to Jono to introduce and then afterwards Catherine um, while people are slowly trickling in and then I'll do some virtual housekeeping. Uh, e mō mō lava no Sydney be inga male anga lelei male lofa male falo ole o tato a tua uh, au te fatalo fa atu pa ia male ma malu te tato au le ngai uh, lo ingo yo nga kanga se au te sao mai au kilangi si si fo lo kumalu sa mo lo kinga lu palangi talo fa talo fa lava. So hey, uh, my name is Jono. Um, I work for the Mental Health Foundation um, as a health promoter, um, but outside that I have a background in sexual violence prevention and comprehensive sexuality education, um, as well as working with um, rainbow communities and with Pacific communities. I'm super excited to be on today um, and to continue this conversation around trauma-informed sexual violence work. Well, Catherine. He mihi mahana ki koutou So um, thank you so much for having us into your offices or homes or wherever else you're viewing this podcast or this um, webinar. So I'm Catherine Gallagher and I'm from Canterbury, Christchurch, and um, work for an agency called START. So I'm the clinical manager there and START um, works with um, people of all ages who have experienced sexual violence and provides therapy support as well as advocacy and um, crisis support. So really looking forward to um, being with you for this hour and a half and um, yeah, for all the questions and, and, and conversation that come out of this. Thanks, Miriam, for organising. Oh, my pleasure and lovely to have you both online. Um, I know that we were just pr uh, practising before and it's um, we were having some great conversations. So hopefully the 39 people can join us in these conversations together. Um, so just acknowledging you know, today's session, um, of course, in the title, it's very obvious that we're going to talk about sexual violence um, but we know that for some that is not a common experience in their daily work and for some it's very common so I've just popped in the chat um, the link for safe to talk just in case anything comes up from the conversations today that you feel you might need extra support or want to follow up with um, someone that you can talk to and also um, through safe to talk you can access all of the crisis services across the country and that can also offer more follow-up care uh, in terms of today's session, you know, as per usual, if you look on your navigation screen, there is a little speech bubble where there's a chat and I can see some lovely people already telling us in the chat who they are and where they're from. Unfortunately, Zoom has this really weird default function that unless you click it, <coughs> it will only message us three. So if you want to talk to everyone, just click next to the two to all panellists as attendees and then you'll be able to talk to each other. So really keen to hear who you are, where you're from. <coughs> and what's going on. You can ask questions in the chat and in the Q&A box. So um, we're gonna have different moments today to actually ask questions. This session is being recorded so that you can access it later and for all of those who weren't able to make it today, um, we'll also be able to share it with them and the slides will be available afterwards too. Um, is there anything I've left out in terms of intro? I think that's all, eh? So we're going to get started. We are going to try and go for about an hour and a half, but if we finish a bit earlier, um, then we might wrap it up earlier, but with, that's the amount of time that we have available and acknowledge that some people um, might not be able to stay for that whole time. So it is being recorded if you do need to leave earlier. So kia ora koutou, let's get started. Um, just need to click on the right screen. So it is a carry on from the first session. So the learning objectives stay the same. So creating safe learning, uh, learning outcomes for the two sessions are creating safe learning environments using facilitation, co-facilitation, communication sales by projecting calm, confident, positive persona, recognize different emotion, emotional states and group settings, manage them to ensure the safety and well-being of participants, engage with target groups by using participatory teaching methods modeled in consent, and relating respectfully, 
and a sensitivity to the complexity of power authority privilege within the context of Aotearoa New Zealand. In today's session, we're going to do a little bit of a recap of what we did last session around the role of the facilitator. A, little, a lot more in depth around understanding behaviour and trauma, um, because lots of questions popped up from last session that we thought would be really useful to address. Going specifically into the needs of young people and responding to, um, to behaviours in the classroom. All of this um, is part of the to, um, Te Wakiahina National Network Ending Sexual Violence Together um, Tau Caucus Workforce Capability for Prevention Framework. So um, some of these we did talk about last time and we did send out to everyone the, the document with all of the information. So we won't go into depth, but it is, um, that's where lots of this information kind of is framed in. So going into the role of the facilitator, Jono, did you want to link us in a little bit with what we did last time? Yeah, so on the last session, we talked a lot about um, what's on your screen at the moment, that the, when we're talking about uh, trauma-informed practice or trauma-informed facilitation, um, that the, the key part to it is rather than focusing on our content, actually talking about how we connect with who's in the room, what might be in the room, and holding that as we're we're doing our kind of job parts, which is often communicating content across, but thinking about how how that might land with people um, so that we can focus on building relationships inside of our, our um, facilitation times, practices. Um, yeah, so I mean the, the slide sums it up really well. Um, <laughs> that when we when we when we're walking into a room to start facilitating or start holding space. Um, that we think about how we connect with that room before we start going, cool, we need to cover this and this and this and this and this and this and this. Because sometimes that content will come out in a, um, more naturally once we go, cool, we know who's in the room, we've built those relationships, mm -hmm. that trust is starting to flow. I think that covers up pretty much everything <laughs> from an hour and a half uh, a couple, last week. Absolutely, that was great. Thank you so much, Jono. And um, just to kind of like grow from that one of the um, facilitation models that I use a lot and um, I know others use a lot is thinking about the three P's to really help guide us in our practice so firstly we think about the people so exactly what John I was saying what who are the people in the room that we're going to be connecting with what is the purpose of our connection and that will guide and define our process and this um, for me it also helps um, me understand, am I the right person to be in the room at any one time? Um, and that links to this other slide of really thinking about is the purpose of being in the room with a group around prevention? And so I'll be talking about a prevention education space or actually are we talking more about intervention? So this is about us really always thinking of our own scope of practice. Who are we? What is our skill set? Um, who are we employed by? What is the clinical backing we have? And is it appropriate, appropriate for us to be facilitating at that specific session? Um, and then exam a practical example of that is, um, is a prevention, uh, a prevention agency is being asked to deliver something like a parent evening in a school connected to a prevention program, or actually being asked, or another request is, you know, a group of parents with children with lived experience of trauma are being asked to do a psychoeducation session. That's a quite a different context, different group, different population, um, different needs. And, and not every, some people can go across the spectrum and other people can't. And I wonder if um, either of you have anything you'd like to come delve into because we've got three different people online with different scopes of practice um, and could move across those uh, that continuum easily or not. So if thinking of the children with lived experience and their parents, that's outside of my scope of practice. And I'm really clear about that boundary. What, uh, Catherine, did you want to have anything to add to that? Um, I, I completely agree with you, Miriam, and I think part of it is your own self-awareness and confidence because we get invited to step over boundaries and over lines all the time um, and not from a, from a bad place, from people wanting to know or wanting to be helpful. And so sometimes it is about our own sense of confidence to be able to say it's okay that we don't know this. But that doesn't mean we just put a big block up and say, no, ask someone else. 
we may well be able to facilitate a really warm handover to someone who does know, or we may be able to uffy that person's question and, and hear it and support it as a really good question. And so they actually feel confident to ask it again. So, so we can still do something quite therapeutic and helpful, even if we don't actually ask the question. Um, and so saying no um, doesn't have to be the, the wrong outcome. You know, it can be exactly what we need to be doing in a safe outcome. And I think of that in terms of boundaries in general, often um, it's about widening the help around people instead of feeling that it's a no and a cut off, but that, you know, we're going, this is how much I can do and let's bring more people in to help us um, and using our, you know, our skill as linkers, as connectors, as networkers to build more, um, build a, a stronger network around our communities and people that might need help so it's um it's about reframing it within ourselves of we're not we're never alone in this work and we should never do this work alone but we need to have a big team um with lots of different skills and and really i think um you know the prevention education is a new um it's relatively new science and role and it's not it's not often very well defined as a professional practice and a professional identity. So th this is kind of highlighting that we haven't defined this, but we haven't got this very well defined in our communities yet. And this is, I suppose, a bit of a, a seed to throw out to all of you listening on today around have a think about, you know, what is your scope of practice and start to define this really well for yourselves um, and the workers that you've got around you um, and then link in with other agencies to keep defining this together. So um, this really links into the next piece of ultimately whenever we're in, we're in any work when we're working with people is about doing no harm. And so ensuring that we're working within our scope of practice and whenever we're in doubt that we're linking in with others that can help us unpack that. So ideally your supervisors, your clinical managers at work or clinical managers and other allied um, services that we can link with. Being mindful of our own personal limits and our own well-being, because um, also being really intentional around what we're role modeling in our communities um, in terms of self-care and well-being um, and vibrancy of this work. And this kind of links us into the next section that we're about to go into around trauma is that when we're talking about trauma informed, we mustn't get confused about keeping this question of trauma in mind and explicitly asking the questions around trauma. I'm wondering, Catherine, you always have lots of richness to um, add to these um, parts around trauma, if you wanted to add some more on that and the points after. Um, I mean, I think when we hear for trauma-informed care, I mean, trauma has become a very popular word and, and I'm pleased. I work in the trauma area for us to have great understanding around that and for it to be kept in mind um, is a really powerful and important thing. But it's a bit like that pendulum that, that one of the challenges is when, when, when trauma becomes seen everywhere, um, we think we can feel pressure to ask about it. We can feel um, some um, misconceptions around if we're keeping it in mind, does that mean we actually have to say, hey, look, what happened to you? Tell me what happened to you because isn't it good to talk about it? Um, this is about, yes, of course it's good to talk about it if the person is ready, if you're the person who has the skills to hear it and receive it safely and work with it. Um, so, so again, it comes back to that scope issue and, and, and that person's safety. By keeping it in mind, it just means that as, as we'll talk about through this, um, through this workshop um, or webinar, that there are some ways to, in, in, in actual fact, you could argue it's good clinical practice, as we were talking before, Jono, you know, to, to be aware of the person sitting in front of you and what they might be faced with and what they might be challenged by and, and adapt your um, approach to them accordingly. That's what we're talking about. It's not having to dig into detail. John, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? Yeah, um, I try not to add too many things that we're going to cover <laughs> off later on in the yeah, yeah. Um, One of the things that I think that sits with me a lot, um, and I know Catherine's going to go into a little bit more about what trauma actually is and, and how to think it, like how to kind of define it outside of the buzzword that it has kind of become at the moment um, is that for me, when I'm thinking about it, especially when I'm sitting um, in a room facilitating or if I'm walking into a, um, a more uh, counselly sort of space, um, is thinking about trauma as trauma is those things that um, were too hard to, to feel at the time when an experience came up. Um, and so 
for someone, of course. Um, so as a facilitator, my, my, my thinking always goes to, and I said this earlier, um, it was like, oh, should I say it or not? But essentially, trauma and form practice, Catherine's, I've got Catherine's backing, so we're all good. <laughs> essentially, trauma and form practice is about not being a dick when you're, when you're standing in front of a room and holding that space, thinking about there are other people in the room and other people have had all sorts of different experiences. Um, some of those experiences might have been great. Some of those experiences might not have been great, which is kind of the trauma stuff. So um, thinking about that as we walk into rooms or walk into um, situations, that's the sort of stuff, how do I do no harm around that? And also acknowledging our own, like, like it says there, the second point being mindful of our own personal limits and well-being, um, is essentially saying, what are, the, what are our own boundaries? And when are the points that we have to say, actually, I'm not the right person? So having those thoughts ahead of time means that we walk in a hell of a lot more prepared when we're starting to um, work in the spaces with others. Mm. Yeah. And, and I suppose that's what these kind of um, webinars are all about is how do we be intentional? Mm -hmm. Because one of the things, I mean, we're going to talk a little bit about the brain coming up, but the brain loves a plan. Mm. And, you know, it calms down when it has a plan, even if the plan's a silly one. But anyway, as soon as it has a plan, it calms down. So if we go into a situation and kind of know, you know, what our scope is, kind of know what our role is, know a little bit about what's what we're going to be walking into, our brain is generally calmer. So the outcome is typically pretty much, you know, rolls a bit more smoothly as opposed to crossing fingers and going, we're all good. Absolutely, and um, we're going to talk a little bit more about scotias um, later, but I just can relate to um, one of the things I changed when I became the team leader of one of the teams that were doing prevention education was actually creating lots and lots of role play trainings so that, um, so that we were practicing in action constantly, so that we had a plan mentally, um, we, had, we had a mini experience so that we didn't freak out in the group and actually practicing a lot. And people often hate role plays, but we talked about that last time, that it's actually the best way for us to train as facilitators, as community, people engaging with the community is practicing a lot um, before we go out into the community. Okay, so now we're going to delve into trauma and behaviour. So if you do have questions over this section, we'll, we'll try and respond as we go. Let us know what, um, what you need from us, um, especially as we've got Catherine who explains it so well and has such a huge amount of knowledge. Um, so Catherine, if you want to direct me with the, the slides, um, I can just um, go at your pace. Did you want to talk this one would, though, Miriam? Because yeah, that was kind of you setting the scene. Yeah, so the scene um, here is really around, first of all, why do, why do prevention workers need to know about trauma? And it was really interesting when we were doing the research back in 2017, I got asked this a lot because I kept putting in the documents that tr um, prevention workers needed to have a baseline understanding of trauma and also the a basic understanding of how healing could occur in its diverse forms you know there's lots of different journeys but just a basic understanding of what safe trauma practice looks like in that healing space therapy space long-term recovery space and the reason for that is first to um um, so I'm going to start backwards is to be able to explain trauma and education settings and actually that real role that we can have of um, being able to do some basic community information of this is what happens, this is what counselling could look like um, and demystifying some of the things that probably lots of our communities are worried about. And lots of people in the community don't want to go to a therapist because they don't want to talk about it. Um, it being the trauma event. So being able to demystify some of that in a really accurate way is really important. Um, having an, having it within sexual violence prevention education, one of our aims is to change attitudes, beliefs and behaviours. And if we don't actually understand um, some of those concepts, then we're, we have a limited understanding of our practice. Um, also understanding trauma, how can it impact people's decisions in the moment, in particular in the cases of sexual assault. And um, some questions popped up last time of, you know, what should we be teaching? Is it fight, flight or freeze? Um, and it's it's kind of understanding actually what's happening in that moment it helps us understand how we can also talk about it with a group of young, with, within a group. Um, and then really getting to understand people's lived experience and the, the design of any prevention program. So that... Um, 
you know, if if we are thinking about being trauma informed, then we need to understand what it might be like for someone in a, in the classroom listening about these things, so we can design activities safely, so that we can think about, you know, are we giving the participants all of the responsibility for their safety and well-being, and can they actually go about doing that, or should I bring in more safety around them so that it's easier for them to access help? So this is how we can become better preventionists is by having a really sound knowledge of trauma um, in our in our kitty, I suppose, in general. And I think either of you would like to add on that. Um, I just was reflecting on on that continuum we had before about prevention towards intervention. And I think as someone who works in more in, well in, in both spaces, but more in the intervention space, actually someone understanding themselves and having what's going on for them make sense is absolutely intervention. Mm. So I think one of the things that we don't do often as clinicians, we don't do that well is psychoeducation or giving a really sound picture of, of what trauma is. And I think if you're able to, to, to have that down pat and really get it, um, then you're going to actually make a huge difference for people because we all like to make sense. And that helps us panic less and it helps us feel um, much more safe within our own skin. So it's, it's, you can't underestimate how, good, how important this is. Absolutely. Okay. Take it away, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think as part of that making sense, I mean, clearly no one's going to put their hand up and say, can I have some trauma, please? Um, you know, we tend to, it, 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 it's, it's, it's pathologized. It's not a nice experience. Um, and quite rightly, um, you know, it, we need to understand it and keep, treat it with respect. But we also need to know that it makes a lot of sense. And one of the things that, that I think makes psychoeducation or education around, uh, around um, trauma and, and sexual assault so important is that when you actually, this stuff does make sense. So the symptoms, the things that people are presenting with, um, even though it can be complicated, actually, um, when you boil it all down, um, people are doing exactly what they need to be doing to survive a moment. And their brains and bodies step in to protect them. And so if we can then tell someone enough information that means they get rid of the big stick that hits them over the head saying, you're doing this wrong, how dare you, you should be over this by now. And if we can frame it up as a nervous system injury that needs um, realistic care and time and patience to be able to heal, then suddenly all of that layer of judgment tends to be able to get parked a little bit more. Yeah. So ultimately, um, an understanding of trauma comes from understanding about fear. And, and really, as you can imagine, we need fear um, and because that helps us stay alive. So just going on to that next slide. Um, you know, people hopefully are aware of the fact that we have an alarm system. Um, we share it with all other living creatures um, who are still surviving because clearly those who didn't have alarm systems got eaten or not very effective alarm systems got eaten. So our alarm system, and, and if we go to that next slide, Miriam, sits in the back of our brain, you know, if you want to see via the, um, me turning around, mm -hmm. and it, it sits back here in, in this lower part of the brain and it deals with information coming in and works out whether we're safe or not. So even though you can see there's lots of lobes here, there's lots of, of connections, there's lots of complicated things which have got lots of Latin names attached to them if we go into any more depth, ultimately the brain's body, its main job is to work out are we safe or not. And if for whatever reason the brain's worked out that we're not safe, then all the resources that we're doing all the other things that our brain does kind of get parked <laughs> And our, and our alarm system, which sits down in that bottom base survival part of the brain, takes over. And will have, people will have heard about that fight, flight, freeze response. And the reason why that takes over is because it's working out how do we get out of a situation alive? Because that's the brain's priority. So just going on to that next slide, Miriam. Um, these are from, I think, the Tour Nest um, webinar. So if people are interested to know some more about this stuff, it's a really excellent resource that people can kind of click into. Um, but ultimately, this alarm system, even though I'm giving it good press and saying it's a really handy thing, the flip side was it was designed a long, long time ago, and it was designed for threats that could actually eat you. And so really handy that it had a fight response, it had a runaway response, and it had a freeze response which were kind of like all really, really handy things to do if the tiger was coming at us 
Um, and, you know, we wanted to get out of that situation alive. So if people think about when they get stressed or when they fear, feel afraid, literally what happens is our heart starts beating, our muscles tense up, um, you know, our, um, you know our, our brain starts to actually not function as well because all the resources from the brain are going into that alarm system to make, guess what, our hearts start beating and our muscles tense up because that's what the bodies decide is the priority in that moment. Now, those first three... Um, uh, when the brain's decided that we've still got a fighting chance, yeah? When we look at that bottom F on the left, the flop, that's when the brain's kind of decided, hey, wait a second, um, our chances of survival here have kind of, you know, aren't so hot. So really, um, we're scraping the bottom of the barrel here about how to get through a situation um, intact as possible. So the flop option is, I don't know if you've ever watched any of those David, At David Attenborough um, documentaries, but it's the animals playing dead. It's that idea that, in fact, if the predator is about to take a big munch, then how do I um, look like a dead piece of meat? And literally, um, predators in the wild don't tend to go towards dead pieces of meat that aren't obvious how they died, because in fact, if I eat it, I might get poisoned. Now, of course, that's a pretty high risk strategy in 2020. You know, there's not too many predators walking around, but the brain hasn't kind of evolved that far from there. It's still looking at how is, what's the last ditch effort I can do to survive. Now, if not being eaten is, is you know, not an option, then in fact, the other benefit of the flop option is that if I'm going to get eaten, I'm going to disappear somewhere um, into my body and brain. And so when I do get eaten, it won't hurt. So people may well have heard words like dissociation. That's kind of in the extreme level of what happens. It's we dissociate, we disappear, so that if I'm going to be hurt, um, I won't feel it. And that's a really common thing, especially in the sexual violence sector. And I think one of the things that, that a really key part of psychoeducation is what we're saying to people is, hey, you know how you handled that situation? You know what you did? Guess what? Your nervous system kind of stepped in there and made those decisions for you. And I'll often say to people things like, you know, if we sat here and really tried hard to not breathe, you know, I'm sure you're a compliant bunch. You can do it privately. You're in your own homes. We're not watching. So if you um, really worked hard and tried to hold your breath, what would ultimately happen? Now, Jono and Miriam, you can answer. <laughs> what's going to happen if we hold our breath, hold our breath? Ultimately, what's our body going to do? Just not start breathing when it's almost at that point of yeah. dying. <laughs> it's, it, we can literally not stop ourselves from breathing unless we're in doing something else rather drastic. Or, Our or body will start... Training, eh, of, you know, but if, like, at some point you can extend how long you can hold your breath for, but it will still... It will still to... breathe. And yeah. if you were so compliant, and I mean really dedicated to the, to the role, you could actually hold your breath till you passed out. I mean, like, all kudos to you. What would your body do as soon as you passed out? Breathe. Yeah. So I think that, that it's examples like that. It's like sitting there with someone and saying, you know, let's try really hard and stop our hair from growing. Or let's sit here and try really hard and stop blinking. Mm. People kind of smile and go, well, of course you can't. But when it comes to responses, we kind of go, well, I should have fought back. Or I should have run. Mm. You know, or I should have at least been awake. And, and again, it's that reminding of, hey, actually, you had little to do with this. It was your brain deciding what needed to happen in that moment to stay alive. And I think lots of these, um, like our communities understanding these responses better and understanding actually how physiological it is and it's not yep. cognitive, it's not at a brain level. And um, there's some really interesting research around emotions and um, responses and culture. And this level is actually... Um, shared by all humans no matter what cultural ethnic group they're from and um, where it differs might be around meaning at making afterwards um, and how we understand it afterwards but this response is shared <clears throat> um, is shared across the board um, and and I think the more we understand this um, the body's responses to threat it might also help challenge some of those very strong victim blaming issues that we have that often are our community trying to make sense of why didn't someone run or um, fight back and and we have an answer now of going actually it's part of 
how we're designed as humans. Um, yeah. And, really and, and going to that friend option, I think that this is another important point when we think about victim blaming is that, you know, before all this stuff happens, you know, if, 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 if the ground started shaking now um, and you're in a room with colleagues, I imagine the first thing you'd do would be to look to them. Now, it's a bit weird because we're on webinar. So, you know, I might look to you, Jono, and you, Miriam, and you're in different parts of the country. So if my ground is shaking, um, it's probably a Christchurch thing. So I'd probably be sitting here looking at myself. Anyway, but we socially reference because we were designed that way to seek out, to flock together, to, to kind of connect with people, to work out just how big a threat this is. Because if I'm having a bit of a hard time working out how scared I should feel, I'm going to look to you. And if you're freaking out, that's a pretty good clue that I should freak out too. If you're looking pretty calm, then in fact, um, oh, maybe I need to actually adjust how I'm reacting. Now, this is a really good clue, you know, a bit of a, a taster for, for how we're going to go with this, is that how you respond in the front, in the, in the um, face of other people being stressed can actually help regulate their system. Mm. The other part of this friend thing, though, is that when we are um, dealing with um, situations of grooming, or when um, things, sexual abuse is happening in, in, um, with trusted people, then in fact our tendency to go towards connection and to, to, to seek out safety with people who are supposed to be keeping us safe means that our system can actually backfire on us a little bit. Mm. And we can try and stay in connection with people who might actually be hurting us. Because mm. in fact there are, can be a whole lot of drivers that say actually connection and um, being attached to people is actually more important than say, well, it's a very essential part of safety. Mm. So again, some of that victim blaming can link in with people going, well, why didn't you tell? Mm. Why did you keep going back? Mm. You know, you, you were in the, you know, we were next door. You could have just called out. Well, there can be a whole lot of reasons why I didn't just call out. Um, and it can be linked with this nervous system response. So we've got a little question here, <clears throat> and I'll make sure that I read it properly. Um, so if a person is diagnosed with a mental disorder, and for the person that um, put it in the chat, if you have any kind of further description of men what you mean by mental disorder, does it affect how we can educate them about trauma? So I suppose that kind of it's getting us thinking about <clears throat> how we tailor different information for different audiences and um, and what we might bear in mind there? Um, I mean, it, it's a very broad question, yeah. um, as is this topic. So um, this is a wee snapshot. I mean, I think that you could even, I mean, you could argue that, that, that mental, dis mental disorder is often actually the brain and body's response to try and cope with stress and, and ge um, genetics and all those other sorts of things. So, in fact, the, if we actually understand their mental disorder or mental illness, um, it can make a lot of sense in mm -hmm. terms of why they're presenting in this way. And so one of the biggest things is um, we're not wanting to pathologize. We're wanting to understand and so in, in educating someone or in talking to someone around this stuff, we're wanting to present this information not as the expert, you know, this is how it is. We're wanting to be curious. We're wanting to have some, some basic information that, that we can feed into the conversation that reassures, that, that validates, that makes clear. Um, but we're also, again, being cautious and, and, and not making assumptions about how it might be heard. So as an educator, whatever we say, we're hopefully, and this is what makes webinars so difficult, is if you're all sitting in the room, I'd be able to see the yawners and I'd be able to see the people who are rolling their eyes and I'd adjust what I was saying accordingly or I'd pathologize you and tell you that you know nothing about what I'm saying. So it's your fault. Just joking. Um, depending think, on what mood I'm in. Yeah. Um, and I think so I would feed back to or I would respond yeah. to how you were doing it. So if someone in the, in the room wasn't getting it or was getting distressed, I would adjust accordingly. I think the other, uh, sorry, I'm just going to jump in and add no, no, go. Um, the other thing to remember as well is that when we're talking about somebody with a, who's been diagnosed with a mental illness, um, the question to ask is, you know, the way, what I would do if I'm talking about trauma or thinking about trauma, um, I mean, specifically the questions asking about educating about what trauma is, I'd be thinking, are they currently in a state of mental distress or do they just have a, you know, mm. live with a diagnosis that, um, but right now they're perfectly fine. Um, that's, that's a really 
a, a different um, conversation. Yes, mental distress. So when we're talking about mental distress, I, I guess um, one of the things I'd be thinking about is for me, I'd be holding that as, okay, cool. Sometimes people's experiences of mental health system can be traumatic for them as well. Sometimes being diagnosed can be traumatic. Um, a traumatic experience for some people. Sometimes, as, as you said, Catherine, um, experiences of trauma can lead to, okay, I need to go and get a diagnosis so I can get some support and access to services and access to help. Um, and so I guess what, what I'd be thinking about here um, is that I, I need to keep, and I, we'll talk about this more as we go through the webinar as well in terms of um, a scope of practice and, and um, purpose of practice, but I think um, for me, I'd be thinking, okay, cool, I need to keep in mind that some people may have some experiences, may be experiencing distress, um, and tailor accordingly, um, but not necessarily completely change what I'm saying necessarily. Because um, I think adding to that, Jono, is that people with mental um, illness aren't broken. Yeah. You know, and, and so I think that that uh, I absolutely agree that, that you want to be sensitive but we also don't want to become so sensitive that we don't say stuff that needs to be said. Yep. And that getting that balance of empathic confrontation, you know, we, we're saying some potentially quite challenging things, but we're doing it with empathy. Sorry. Yeah. To I could add to that. I think um, what we said at the very beginning, it goes whether we're working with an individual or a group is that we connect before content. So yeah, yeah. actually the first piece, whoever this person is, is are we connected? Like how, how have we built a relationship in terms of a professional relationship? What's the context? What's the scope of practice? And then we evaluate if actually giving any of this information is appropriate in that moment, eh? Um, because, you know, just because we know this stuff doesn't mean it's appropriate to give it to someone else. Um, and if it's, you know, being, if there's someone who's visibly distressed, are they actually going to be able to retain any of that information? So those are just kind of some things of, you know, connect before content. Um, and I definitely have seen it um, working in crisis that sometimes people were giving a whole bunch of information, but the person was actually outside of the room because they were disassociating. And then it's going, well, is that, um, that's, that was more useful for us <laughs> and validated us that, yes, we can, you know, ramble about trauma, <laughs> um, but not actually useful for that person in the room. Because but, I, but ironically, Miriam, what might have been useful is your tone of voice and um, being physically a person in their presence and the cup of tea you made them. So sometimes we yeah. don't quite know the magic, but Absolutely. it's about all of those things that we're able to do. And um, yeah, and, and checking in and being being aware um, of ourselves and our own process because yeah. our nervous systems do talk to each other. So if we're feeling really, really stressed, that's going to get communicated. Mm -hmm. So how do we keep ourselves calm or regulated in, in doing those things? Yeah, cool. Really good question though. Okay. Do so... We normally, because um, again, this alarm system is normal, you know, and, and I, I shouldn't give away a trade secret, but as a clinical psychologist, um, quite often um, your normal, I might not say it like that, but that's what I'm communicating, is the thing that comes, comes up through in conversations because most people are responding in a really normal way to a situation that they're confronted with. And what shapes up that normality is their history, their biology, all of those things. So... Um, the thing about our alarm system, though, is it was designed for short bursts of energy um, needed to stay alive. And normally, you know, we get the chance to repair. So we might have something that gives us a good old fright um, and then, or, or have an experience that freaks us out. And we typically get back into a normal rhythm um, and our blood flow that was back here, keeping us alive, gets a chance to come back into the other areas of the brain if we do things like talk it through, um, link it with previous experience, previous experience ideally that we might have survived or, or got support around, taking a good old deep breath, um, which is essential because um, that helps regulate the system, um, having a hug, having a rest, drinking a cup of tea. So all of those things that we think, oh, no, we need a really complicated response. Often it's about coming back to basics because that's actually how the alarm system was designed to get turned off. But there's a qualifier. So just going on to that next slide, um, there is a design fault. And I've already kind of made, well, there's a couple of design faults, actually. One is, as I said before, our alarm system was designed for a few hundred thousand years ago, you know, 
I don't know my obviously the time frames are accurate, but it was designed for <laughs> a while ago. It was designed for predators. And so our alarm system wasn't necessarily designed for this webinar that I needed to prepare for or, um, you know, the pile of work I've got waiting for me back at, at work or, um, you know, the fact that my kids, you know, they're, they're broken up with their girlfriend and their heart's broken. So, you know, all of those things um, weren't what our alarm system was designed for. The other design fault is that the smart thinking part of our brain, which is clearly firing right now as you're listening to our wise words, can think about things like, well, what if? What if I get back to work and there's a crisis waiting for me? Or it can also think about, remember when? Remember when there was that crisis that I had to deal with and I didn't cope very well and it was really, really messy. So it's capacity to think both to the future and remember the past um, means there's a whole lot more data floating around our brains and our alarm system is not that great at working out what's actually a current threat versus what is our brain tricking us. And so we have situations where we are having a normal and natural and necessary physiological response, but it's because our brain has tricked us into thinking we're unsafe right now. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so it, yeah, sorry, Mary. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, that's often what commonly gets referred to as triggers and, you know, triggers gets, gets um, you know, thrown around quite a bit in terms of term um, or we try not to re-traumatise or something's re-traumatising. That's, um, that's what's really linked into this um, design fault of what you're talking about, eh? Yeah, yeah. And, and even that's an interesting one because I think that, that you know, re-traumatising and absolutely in the extreme cases, we, we may well be re-traumatising and we need to be very careful about that. But upsetting someone isn't re-traumatising them. Mm. And I think we'll talk some more as we go through that. So it's on a continuum. Mm. But the, the bottom line, simply put, is that our brain, we can, we can have feelings and have physiological responses that actually have nothing to do with the situation that we are currently in. It's a product of our brain remembering or anticipating danger. So I think I've pretty much summarised that next slide. I've kind of jumped ahead for you all. Um, so going, uh, I think, is there anything I've missed there? No. Oh, sorry. I think that's the bottom line is really, really important, though, is that the feelings are always real. So it's not helpful to say, oh, by the way, your brain's tricking you. Don't be silly. <laughs> because at that moment, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, the things feel incredibly real. Mm. So this is where validation is so important because what we're trying to, that's that connect before, um, you know, content. We're wanting to connect with the fact that this feels real. That's really tough. I can see what's going on for you, hey? And then it's about the, the putting in the accurate information, which is, you know, I suppose um, acknowledging that that might be your brain tricking you or these big feelings seem to be coming from a place that's not happening right now, hey? Anyway, so, so that's the, the thing to be aware of, is, is they're not a current threat, but they feel like they are. So just going on to this next slide, which is quite a heavy content slide, but I think that, as I've said to you before, um, often people will, um, you know, one of the biggest things we do to ourselves is criticise ourselves for not handling stuff very well. And so when we're thinking about trauma, um, the fact that it's painful, the fact that we're not moving on from it, um, the other element to that is that we can beat ourselves up for the fact that we're you know, doing all of those things. If we look at trauma, it literally makes sense. So when we are in a situation that the brain has no way of making sense of. So I suspect you guys have done webinars before. So you've turned on today with a bit of an awareness of what a webinar, webinar looks like. You've worked out that, you know, I need to have certain material around me. Even if Jono started up, stood up and started doing some interpretive dance, you'd probably go, that's a bit strange, but kind of we've got enough familiarity with, with webinars and, and Miriam's reasonably re trustworthy. Don't know what Catherine's going to do, but we know enough about this to stay in a frame that we kind of knew what was to be expected. And we probably also know enough about ourselves that even if we were surprised by Jono's dance, we probably wouldn't lose it because actually we've got enough experience of being surprised by things that we know how to handle surprise. Now, in a trauma experience, 
that kind of goes out the window a little bit because you're in a situation where potentially you've never had a similar experience or if you're someone who's had lots of little traumas, in fact, your threshold for jumping into that zone becomes quite fine and, and you jump into that zone quite easily. And so it's high arousal and brain chemicals get released and it kind of mucks up with how our brain experiences a situation. Yeah. So our memory of the event gets affected by that high arousal and it's a pretty messy memory and it lacks um, coherence. Now, the brain hates that because the brain's a, a pattern making machine. It's looking for, well, what did that, how does that link with that? That's why we all stereotype and judge people mercilessly. Our brains were designed that way because otherwise, how would we deal with all the data that's coming our way? We look for patterns, we look for familiarity. So when it's got something that comes in that just can't be made sense of, what does the brain try and do? It tries to make sense of it. It tries to extract the wise lesson. And so people might have used, heard the term flashbacks, and clearly that doesn't um, bode well. We're not thinking yay for flashbacks. But literally flashbacks are the brain's attempt to extract the wise lesson, to work out what just happened. And where's the filing cabinet that I can fit that into so I can put it away. Literally, when it comes into our brain, though, that's pretty distressing. And so what does our brain do <laughs> to protect us? It tries to bump it out. So this is what really happens when people are dealing with trauma, and certainly if it moves into the post-traumatic stress zone, is you've got this pattern of tr being triggered, information coming in, our brain trying to work it out, but then also it being so painful that we try and you know, move on from it and, and kick it out again. So we've got this, this waves of, of processing information. When all that's going on, um, clearly our alarm system isn't neutral. Our alarm system sitting back here is going, what? So literally we are not safe ever. And um, if anyone's from Canterbury living through the earthquakes, you know, when a car rumbles past, our bodies are still responding to the potential of, are we safe? Is this another earthquake coming our way? Even if our brain might be in quite a different space. So we've got people who have experienced trauma who stay in that hypervigilant space. And of course, all the while, the brain is trying to make meaning. Mm -hmm. It's trying to explain um, what's going on and, and, how, and we, you know, how, how do we survive in this situation? And interestingly enough, the brain feels safest when the explanation is clear, even if that explanation puts us at fault. So if my explanation is the reason I was hurt is because I was in the wrong place, wearing the wrong thing at the wrong time, that's clearly not great for my self-esteem. But from a safety point of view, I might hold on to that um, because, in fact, then I know what to avoid. And this is where some of that victim blaming can happen too, Miriam, that you mentioned before, is that if I'm sitting in a situation where I feel quite safe and secure in my world and I know of someone else who was traumatized or was harmed, quite naturally I can kind of go, well, that's because clearly they did something a little bit wrong and that's why they were kind of at risk. Now, logically I'm not thinking that and, and I'm probably not going to admit that in public, but there's a part of me that goes, well, if I know why they got hurt, then that means I won't get hurt because I won't do those things. So again, we've got this interplay between our logic and between kind of our more primitive um, judgments and, and, and ways of keeping safe, um, which if you boil it all up, um, and again, this is a, you know, a five-minute version of what could take weeks <laughs> to explain in more detail, but pretty much what I'm trying to say is PTSD, trauma, makes sense because mm -hmm. this is what the brain is trying to do with that information. And I, I love that description in terms of um, making it very simple in some ways and very human and very, because I think also um, when we hear little bits around trauma stuff, we, we get, um, we get almost hyper vigilant ourselves as, as workers and, and try and overcompensate to something that's going to be actually really normal. Like, Often, um, you know, when I was working in classrooms, it really did feel like often ripping a Band-Aid off people with a lived experience. And it's there's some bits that it's if we're going to be talking about this in public, you know, and they've chosen to stay in the room, as long as we've given people choice and that they know that they cannot have to be in that room. You know, there's there's also some, uh, I think, 
giving people so the benefit of their own wisdom of what mm -hmm. um even if they people are young often young people know how to what's good for them and what's going to be working for them um not always but there's you know and there's lots of conversations we could open up at that but um i suppose that thing around trauma is that actually people are quite resilient as well yeah and, um, and i'll just add to that too is that not everybody's going to look like this yeah so not everybody who's been traumatized will develop PTSD because their brain and bodies are going to process this in different ways. Not everybody who's, um, you know, been traumatized is going to um, react when the door gets slammed and um, suddenly lose it and become really distressed. Often people who have been traumatized um, look just like you and me, you know, because yeah. in fact they are you and me, you know, and, and um, they may look reasonably smiley and happy when in fact inside some different things are going on. So I think that, that you're really wanting to not make assumptions. Yeah. Um, but if you were going to make an assumption, a pretty safe assumption would be to go, there's feelings in the room. And if I can be as regulated and um, as calm in my own presentation style, then whatever else might be going on for other people, my sense of regulation and calm and, and competence with what I'm talking about will help. Yeah. Not when we talk about we actually lend our nervous system and our brain yep. to those who are dysregulated and that concept of co-regulation is so important. So if we are going to be facilitating anything, anywhere, <laughs> um, can, do we know how to regulate ourselves? Um, do we know what that look? Do we know how to bring ourselves back into a state of calm? Even when we get that curly question that completely throws us, can we be thrown and stay calm? And, and, and I'd just jump in there a little bit, Miriam, yeah. and say that, that I, I wouldn't necessarily always see regulated as calm. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> yeah, sorry, because I think that you can actually be going, bloody hell, I don't know the answer to yeah, that, yeah. and be a bit freaky, but how do we push through that and actually regulate? Same with in real life. I can be incredibly angry at my partner or my, my boss, who I know is watching this right now, just joking, Maggie, um, <laughs> and go, actually, I can have angry thoughts yeah. and still think at the same time yes you know and and that's the challenge is that we can make some assumptions that if i'm regulated i should be calm which can put extra pressure on ourselves whereas in actual fact it, it is just about how do we come back to a state of homeostasis how do we come back to to um yeah our core so i'm just going to skip ahead to this yep. slide and maybe just open up um uh, just someone commented totally great simple explanation Catherine thank you maybe just open up for some questions because we're going to move away from this trauma like if explaining the nuts and bolts of trauma um, and moving into some uh, other topics so if there's any questions people have either put them in the Q&A or in the chat or maybe just put in the chat what anything new you've learned maybe let us know if there was something you hadn't heard before that you did and we'll just give you a couple of maybe 10 seconds to think about that and start typing and if there's no urgent typing we'll move on i guess yeah go for it Jono. well um while people are typing in their questions or or thoughts or comments um as as an er, like earlier on in my career when i was a um a facilitator in sexual violence prevention work um just to kind of back up knowing this stuff and keeping it in the back of my mind as I was walking into classrooms actually made it a hell of a lot easier for me to feel comfortable in a classroom space. Um, and I think that's really important to keep in mind. Um, I think Catherine, you were talking about um, us as facilitators trying not to be hyper vigilant when we walk into classrooms or walk into education spaces or even group settings um, around oh my God, everything I say is going to trigger everybody and I'm so scared of talking because I think all that ends up doing is um, creating a barrier to the way we, we build relationships in the room. Mm. Um, so keeping that in mind is, is really, it's important for us to know this stuff as a baseline, um, as I think you mentioned, Miriam, um, but reminding ourselves that we don't have to teach all this stuff. Um, and as, you know, even now, I'm, I still learn more and more and more about how trauma has impact on the body but more often than not, I don't mention most of that stuff when I'm talking in front of um, groups. It's just the stuff that I need to have in mind mm. so that I can do my job even better than before. 
Um, and which, actually the breadth of knowledge we need to be able to do this work effectively is huge, eh? So in terms of trauma, yeah. facilitation, um, information about sexual violence, prevalence, it's it's a lot. Um, Relationship to, building. Yeah. Well, so the ir irony is that you're actually using the brain's, um, you know, functioning exactly as you operate. Because yeah. if we think about if people are in the presence of a calm, safe, you know, competent person, I'm describing you there, you know, or us all, that that actually helps them calm down. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, it's I, I'm often surprised by the more I know, the less I do. Now, does that make sense? You know, that, that I'm not having to make the noise. I'm, I'm actually just being and realizing that as the facilitator or as the clinician, it's, it's how we hold ourselves that is actually the point, you know, Absolutely. and how we communicate. Mm. And, and there's that great term, you know, the, those who are experts can explain things so simply. And, you know, when you know, when you have complete mastery over something is when you can explain it in really simple terms and distill mm. it. So, mm. um, and that's a journey. So not, and I suppose if you're new to this line of work or if you're developing in this line of work, that's, um, don't freak out if you can't do it yet. Just keep working at it. Um, mm. would be. So there's a couple of questions. Overall, um, people are finding it really useful. Some things um, that people found interesting is that they didn't realise that um, psychoeducation is actually really important um, for people that might have experienced trauma in that one-on-one -on -one situation. Um, they found the explanation of the five Fs really useful. Um, the Also being able to reframe things around victim blaming. and um, the one question that's come through that I think we could all um, try and answer for ourselves, because I don't think there is one answer to it, and then we can move to the next section, is um, are there any recommendations on how we as facilitators can self-regulate? So that's, um, I don't know if anyone would like to um, start that, but the initial uh, reaction for me or response from me is that actually it's, it's so individual, um, and each one of us, we're all unique and and that is I suppose one of the, the the reasons why I love this type of work is that it forces me to delve into my own personal world um, and use myself as the most as the key tool of my practice um, so getting to know who I am and what you know where are my little pressure points and bits that make me angry or make me um, squirm and some of it um, and finding finding ways to address them, resolve them, um, explore them, be curious with them is, is probably what I continuously do. Um, and being interested whenever something new pops up. <laughs> and it's like, oh, didn't expect that one. And I think um, that's also when I, when I recruit in this area of work, I'm always very interested when people tell me that they've had a lived experience and they've solved it and they're all better now. And I'm like, um, that's actually a journey as well of we never know what might pop up as well um so yeah interesting interesting stuff i like sorry uh i like to think about um self-regulation as an ongoing process throughout before during and sorry i'm doing hand movements that you can't see before <laughs> during and after um sessions um for me I, I find that a really good way to start to frame up Lots of people talk about self-care, and I'm not a huge fan of the way that self-care is often framed up in our industry or in our spaces, um, because it, it can feel a little bit like it's all your responsibility to look after yourself. But I think the way that I like to talk about um, self-care or self-regulation um, is as, as it's connected to our community as well. And I, th I think I may have mentioned this on the last time, the last webinar, um, but in terms of self-regulation, for me, and, and perfect... I like to, I'm glad to hear that it's actually connected to the way our brain works, but going in prepared, not just on my content, but also in all of this kind of around the, the topic thinking stuff that we need to do. How do I actually do my practice? Having those, that sort of preparation stuff and what might come up and how might I deal with it. Then during the session, sometimes during a session, it's literally about taking a breath back, admitting that I don't know things and saying that this is about us working together. Um, so we're speaking relationally or sometimes going, hey, I've got a plan with my co-facilitator that I'm going to tag in and tag out because I don't know or I'm just feeling a little bit like blindsided. So having those little little things during the session, um, definitely taking a few moments to breathe is how I find really helpful. 
um, mm. especially if I've just been hit with a question or something that I was like, hmm, hello, a new thing that I wasn't expecting to come up during this session, but has, and now I don't know what to do with it. Um, rather than trying to rush into explanation or, or um, burble through something until I have an answer. And then the final part for me is after session. So making sure that we do our debrief work with our co-facilitators or with our managers or whatever, whoever that might be, what is essentially um, peer supervision, one-on-one -on -one supervision with a, a manager or someone else. And, and also, if you can, ensuring that you have somebody external to your org to have those conversations with in safe and confidential spaces. Um, but also those things that look after myself. So I, for myself, um, taking, taking time to have lunch, like out, especially if I'm traveling around doing facilitation, um, sitting out in a park or sitting out where I can see nature and having my lunch that way. So I'm actually taking some intentional time. I find that really useful as a way to mm. kind of frame up um, as part of self-regulation. Because of course, often when we're in these spaces, we don't just do one class in the day or one session in the day and then move on. We end up doing session one and then an hour later, session two, and then an hour later, session three. And oh, whoops, we've got a, a parents meeting tonight as well. And so you're, you're going back to back to back to back to back. So making sure that we're taking time out for ourselves, I think is a really important part. But Miriam, as you said, everybody's kind of self-care measures or self-regulation measures are gonna look really different and it's a, it, this is where the trial and error in a controlled training environment is really useful because you go, ah, that came up for me. How could we deal with this? How can we talk through this? Yeah, I, I agree with everything you guys are saying. And, and I suppose that the one thing I would emphasize is give it some thought. Yeah. Because I think that what we often do is, is just get started and we're not intentional you know and, and so this is about making it intentional and um you know all of those things so that, that that's really helpful and and i think breathe you know i know you said it john o and mary you said it too but that's so important because pretty much that's what starts to calm the body down for us to be able to start thinking the other thing i'd just say is that um interestingly enough what evidence would suggest is that rupture and repair actually builds trust so, you know, you said about trial and error or when someone gives you a question and, you know, you've all been around someone who you know they're fishing for the answer. They don't really know what they're talking about, but they don't want to back down. That doesn't make you want to trust them. It's like politics, although it's probably a more difficult conversation to get started today. We won't go there. Um, but that idea of going, what I mean by rupture and repair is actually to be able to go, hey, whoa, good question. I don't actually know which again could be a slight rupture if you're presenting and that they're looking to you to know all these answers, but what's the repair? But I know how I can find out, or I'm modeling how to sit with not knowing. Mm. And, and that's huge because how many of your teens are going to be sitting with not knowing? And how do you come back from not knowing or how do you come back from a rupture um, and, and, and stay in relationship with people? So um, you know, those things are so important. And just really, really reaffirming your comment, Jono, about regulation being an ongoing process. Mm. If it is at the end of the day or the end of the week, then you're going to get sick on holiday. You know, <laughs> you know it, it is something that you're wanting to do moment to moment. Anyway. And I, I just, um, it links us quite nicely into the next um, phase, but that rupture and repair concept, I, I remember... Um, when when you introduce it in one of our community meeting in our networking meetings there was a real reframing for me because often in the especially in the sexual violence sector i hear a lot that we need to always like try and get it always right and that puts a lot of pressure on us and ideally yes we're getting it always right but also when we don't get it right there's um healing and there's trust building in the repairing of not getting it right um and you know we need to do enough homework and research and you know we need to make sure that we're most of the time trying not to um, get the basics not right um, but we can't always um, know everything and we can't always get it right for every person but we can um, stay in relationship and figure out the next steps together which I think is a really powerful reminder of actually trust is built in those spaces mm -hmm. yeah thank you okay so as we talked about at the very beginning um you know what we're looking at is understanding our audience. So who are the people that we're gonna be working with? Now we chose young people for this session because we know that the majority, not the majority, a, 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 
a, a significant chunk of um, sexual violence prevention education is happening with young people in high schools, the majority. Um, so we're really thinking of that general population of young people in high schools, which is such a broad <laughs> population group. You know, there is a huge amount of ethnicities, there's a huge range of um, ages and uh, needs. So in thinking about such a general population, we're going to do kind of a generic conversation about young people, but then try and delve into some of the um, actually what might not always um, be true. So the kind of key piece... Um, and help me out you two as well, because we, we're going to have a conversational piece around this. <laughs> um, so it's really understanding also young people. And if we think about children, understanding the psychosocial life development of people is that different state ages and stages have, have different um, moments that people are, are wrangling with in terms of understanding their cell themselves, what's happening in their body, their emotions developing, their sense of self identity, independence and interdependence, also culturally how that might um, come and relate to that. So it's it's really figuring out what are those what is the information that is useful for us to know about young people when we're educating in the community with them. So that could be um, a conversational piece of. Jono, what do you keep in mind when you're working with young people? Pretty much all of that. Um, so often when we talk about young people's development, or often when it does get spoken about, it's in the context of this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then they're adults, and then that we <laughs> change the way we think about it. Um, and it's this linear process that just continues to happen just as a result of I'm getting older, therefore I, I will develop. Um, and I guess some of that stuff is useful to keep in mind. There are some physiological changes that are going to happen, um, but there's all of the things that impact. So all of this, um, the various different diversities that you, you just acknowledged, Miriam, I think have huge impact on the way that young people develop anyway. Um, your cultural context. So Catherine, I think you brought up earlier, um, before we jumped onto the webinar and our little planning session um, around um, kind of different quadrants, different ways to think about it. So there's, of course, the, the body changes, the physical or physiological changes. There's the emotional changes that come up um, and that, that can be, you know, our, um, let me say the right words, emotional growth can change and develop and be impacted by things like um, experiences of trauma or um, just, essentially the environment we grow up in as well, um, the cultural context that we grow up in, and all actually the cultural contexts, I'll say broadly, whether that's our home culture, our, the social culture we are involved in, all of those kinds of things. Um, and I think in the context of, um, I, I find this come up a lot in terms of sexual violence prevention education, um, the stuff around how much do we know from our experiences? So our, um, our street smarts or our, um, our life experience sort of impact um, that some people are oh, sorry and there's also intellectual growth and development as well so when we take all of that and put it together every young person looks very different and sometimes classrooms within the same school can look very very different um, where different levels of development or growth are happening at different um, sp uh, different paces, especially when we put in the complexity of the different areas. Um, so it's useful to know this stuff, um, but it's also important that we don't take it as um, a guide of, okay, I'm walking into a room full of 17-year-olds, therefore, according to the book that I read, this is how we deal with 17-year-olds, full stop, that's it, done. Um, that it's important to acknowledge that within the same room, you might have such a diversity of, of different development and growth. Um, so, again, we don't necessarily need to literally acknowledge that in the room, but it's good for us to acknowledge that in our minds and um, use it as part of our preparation. Um, because if we don't, then we may not be pitching stuff correctly. We may be pitching stuff to the wrong audience. Mm. Um, mm. And, and just feeding, feeding on that, Jono, I think that, that I often say this about working in the, in the sexual violence sector full stop is that we have to honour the complexity. Mm -hmm. So all of those things you just mentioned um, are so, so true. But we also don't want to get freaked out by it. <laughs> because if we get freaked out by it, then actually we do rely on our manuals. 
Because mm. typically what we do when we're scared is either avoid or call in sick, um, don't take the job in the first place, or get the manual and become a little bit rigid because that makes us feel better. So often this is about going again, taking the deep breath, knowing that we know some stuff and literally and be familiar with the content so that when we're in the room, we can actually, in a weird way, in a good way, let the brain do what it was designed to do. And what the brain was designed to do is if we're, if we're calm or regulated enough, we actually pay attention to this stuff quite naturally. Yeah. So, you know, if you're paying attention to someone who's disconnected and kind of, you know, eyes out the room, we notice that stuff because that's what we were designed to do. And if we're co-facilitators, you can work this stuff out quite practically. So it's how do we be regulated enough so that we're paying attention. Yeah. But not forgetting the fact that actually we are still just being a human to another human being. And we're not going to get it wrong. We just might get different versions of right. I love that idea of honoring the complexity. That's a great yeah. frame. I'm yep. going to borrow that from you. Thanks. It's all good. I like you don't be a dick. So um, yeah. I'm going to borrow. <laughs> <laughs> and I think um, that kind of, I think that really ties in well in terms of, um, you know, if we think about, adolescents in particular they're in a you know they are on a journey with it. it's all of its complexities but what we can do in terms of our roles and I think there's a difference if we are someone who's going to be in and out of a young person's life so you know sometimes the short sessions of a mates and dates program a prevention program um, is different so John and I both worked as um, mentoring young people over an extensive amount of time so then we became for me, it was very much a privilege of being part of a young person's life for a couple of years and really sometimes being that, you know, adult that they came to with all of their wonderful um, ideas and needs and interesting things. But it is about being thoughtful, caring and purposeful adult um, and encouraging them actually to also interact more with their peers and get that support at a peer level while they're negotiating this transition. And for me, the kind of key piece in all of that with with any community group, but especially with young people and children, is our boundaries, um, so that we can feel them in the room. We have a we have an actual embodied sense of our own boundaries and the safety connected to them, so that we can feel them in the room live, and role model when we might feel that they're transgressed, uh, transgressed in a kind of a big T and a little T. That could become a teachable moment. Um, and that we can actually discuss it and, and have that experience of rupture or repair of, I felt that actually something disrespectful happened to me. How do we renegotiate this space together as a group um, so that we can be together and learn, continue to learn together in a group? And that requires um, our own hurts to be heard. Um, if we're in the room and our own, our own wounds and our own hurts are alive and well and screaming, um, then it's it's harder for us to do that piece of work. It's harder for us to um, be in that space and and be able to be responsive to other people's needs because our needs are coming up more, more um, ha have more voice internally to us and can distract us. So I think what um, Catherine, you were saying is for us to be able to be so attentive to others, we that sense of um, our own well-being and our own sense of calm is really, really important. Mm. So um, we're coming into the last 15 minutes. Um, and so if anyone has any other questions around any of this, we're going to really talk about mostly responding to disclosures as a way to wrap this up. Um, and But if there are any other questions or anything you've learned so far or any points that you're taking away, please let us know in the chat or in the Q&A box. Any thoughts from you two while our people are collecting their thoughts online? I mean, I, I, I'm just sitting with the, the value of these conversations, hey? You know, it, it's, mm. it's one of the things that, that, you know, we're all going to be coming from our different training and, and obviously training and having knowledge about child development and all those sorts of things. So it's all the stuff that informs us. Um, and it's, it's having conversations with colleagues. It's having safe environments, peer supervision, you know, good people to check this stuff out with. Because if we're feeling like we're standing on solid ground and we've got people in our corner, then we're able to go forth and do this stuff so much more effectively. Absolutely. Yeah, nice. Um, someone else just mentioned honour the complexity. They're also taking this away. So 
Nice. Um, Happy to share. Yeah, yeah. So just reminding ourselves of um, the principles of trauma-informed care, so the concept of safety, choice, collaboration, trustworthiness, transparency, empowerment, and cultural historical gender issues. So we talked about those in the first um, presentation, which is recorded a little bit more in depth. But we're going to really think about these in terms of responding to disclosures. So um, they're... That's probably one of the things that people often um, are worried about when they do this work or, um, you know, sometimes feel a bit freaked out about, especially if they haven't ever responded to a disclosure. So we're going to dive right in into um, thinking about that. I think we talked about this quite a lot. So we'll go straight to the responding to disclosure side. So um, should we first define a, a disclosure very quickly in terms of um, what it is? So um, the, dis the easiest way to think about a disclosure is often people can verbally disclose to someone or they're telling us with their behaviour and it can be either one-on-one -on -one or in a group. And we can think about those in different ways as well. I think we're not going to be able to go into it huge amounts, but we wanted to give some key pieces that actually help anyone in any situation do this in a safe enough way. Um, and can and really then after this session really advise people to go off and get more training in this area because there are um, services that offer responding or dealing with disclosure training um, all over the country. So the first thing is actually to breathe and not panic. Um, and we talked, we've talked a lot and it's tied in really well of um, our own self-regulation, but the, the concept of breathing and pausing before responding and giving yourself a little bit of space to just collect yourself. Um, it doesn't have to be in a calm way, but just, you know, containing your own self for a moment before speaking just allows you that gap. Um, and, you know, that gap can our brain actually works pretty quickly sometimes <laughs> and is quite a powerful little um, processor. So allowing yourself that gap helps um, generate the response. Catherine, I wonder if you wanted to talk about the do no harm and you can do good because um, you've explained that really well before. Um, I mean, I, I think that that's obviously all of these, um, you know, the follow up, follow up bullet points are around saying, get informed, you know, so, so know your policies, you know, and, and Miriam will go through those as we go. And that's really important. But it's also really important to, to know that if, if this is all you ever find out about disclosures, and you find yourself managing one, then to, to treat it like a taonga, it's a gift. And so if all you did was be a human being who cared and um, was calmish and was listening and, and you thanked that person and you um, were present with them emotionally, then that's actually a really good thing that you've done in the life of that person. You may have nothing more to do with them in their journey of healing, but we have a lot of um, people who the person they told and the response of that person has the potential to set off either I want to tell people some more or I want to back up the truck and tell people nothing. <laughs> and so, again, that idea of, of, in a way, don't jump too far forward, that actually just being present, being emotionally, um, you know, comfortable enough in our own skin to be able to hear what they have to say. The only other thing which I don't think is there is that idea that it's not necessarily a taonga that's ours to keep that in fact it may be one that needs to be um, gifted to someone else who can then keep that person safe. And that that's a message that we need to let the young person, people know, that secrets are half the reason why um, this issue is an issue in the first place. Mm. You know, clearly they have the right to private information, but that in fact, um, you know, our job is to help keep them safe. Um, and that sometimes we need to pull up our big girl pants or our big boy pants and have some hard conversations and do some tough stuff, um, and, and that's a really important part of our role. So that's probably more than what you wanted me to say, Miriam, that's, but, you know, said it anyway. Absolutely, that's absolutely perfect, and I think um, that's kind of the where training can be really useful to further some of that because, for example, if we go back to the trauma-informed care principles, um, where you have to, as you said, you know, big, pull your big people's pants up um, and have those hard conversations, knowing how to do that well. So how do you 
um, how do you create choice within that hard conversation so that the person that you're having that hard conversation with um, feels that they have, you know, has that sense that they have some autonomy over themselves, even though we do need to go and tell someone else. That's a quite, that's quite a skill set um, to be able to do that well. So that's where, why we really recommend you need um, further training on this. Um, but, you know, if, if you're, as you're saying, if your response is um, connecting and being clear around your scope of practice and clear of when um, you're not the right person to deal with this. Um, and I think there's a really interesting element where I've trained people and they almost freak out of, you know, trying to have a disclosure and straight away is like, I'm not the right person to talk to. <laughs> Because um, sometimes we are still this fear of you need to get it right. So it's like calming that piece down and connecting and exploring, you know, I'm not a trained counsellor or I'm not trained in this area, but I do know some people who are. Shall we bring them in? Is that useful for you now? Yeah. And, and that's that bit about the do no harm because if someone, if, this is the thing about human nature, they have seen something in you or in this situation that has made them feel safe enough and brave enough to tell. So if all you did was honor that yeah. and go, thanks, you've been so brave. And um, now let's look at what we're going to do with this. Yeah. And then you can say, let's bring in the cavalry. But, you know, yeah. it, it's, that, it's that moment of uffying someone's bravery because they've seen something in you that means that they, um, yeah, want to take this further. But we also, as you were saying, Miriam, it's not solely their choice. And I think this is where often when, I, when we work with children and younger adolescents and even older adolescents, the assumption is that we're dealing with many adults where they get the full choice about whether this gets talked about some more. And so just to put that in there is that, that these, um, sometimes we are actually having to tell people mm. um, because in fact, it's not the young person's decision as to whether um, other people get to know about this to keep safety. And one of our yeah, one of our attendees has just put through some really great examples, actually, of how you can do this quite um, subtly of, you know, yeah. even just offering, you know, we do need to go to somewhere else, but would you like me to be present when you talk to them? Absolutely. Um, so it's those bits of choice. You, yeah. Would you like me to tell them or would you like to tell them? Um, so those are really great examples. Well done for bringing them forward of just very simple things of I still need to go and tell someone else but here's how we can negotiate this space together yeah. and you can, you can have that power back um, on these specific things, um, not on the whole piece because I need to be the adult in this space and actually get um, addressed the safety issues. So, and, no, and just going back to that rupture and repair, because one of the worries that many people might say is that if they say, don't tell anyone that that's a rupture. Mm -hmm. And so they, they want to avoid the rupture. And as we've talked about, and I know I'm a dog with a bone, um, rupture and repair, if done well, is actually creates greater safety and greater trust. So we're not wanting to avoid it. I'd say, I'd say one last thing in there. I know we're very quickly running out of time. Um, is in terms of mitigating power, and this is where getting more training is really important about uh, responding to disclosures. But that often that's part of your setup when somebody comes and starts talking to you. Is if you talk about these things, then I need to, mm -hmm. I will need to. Go and talk to it. So it's it's all about the way that you set up the yeah. um, the conversations as well. Um, and one the last thing that I will say to that just before we move on um, is going back to a point that was made right back at the beginning that as facilitators, as educators, our job is not to process the trauma. Trauma informed practice isn't about us actually. Okay, we've got to fix the problem. We've got to do all the work. It's it's about um, holding space. Um, and often that's a term that gets thrown around a lot, like, oh, our job is to hold space for the young people or hold space for the people that we're training. Um, but Catherine, your description of holding space was stunning. Um, and that's not something that we often dig into when we're in these spaces, hence the, the value and the power of, of these kinds of conversations of what does it actually look, sound, feel like to hold space? Um, and where does our job stop? And we need to make those referrals across. Yeah. So to kind of concretize some of these um, weavings that we've been doing and bringing them to some solid learning blocks, you know, um, if we think about ourselves going out into the community, so 
ideally getting training before we do this um, with some you know solid framing for ourselves and that this hopefully this webinar is not the only place you've learned some of these things um, mm -hmm. knowing your own policies and procedures and the policies and procedures of the setting you're going into um, and that's really important because also we need to hear is is the process for you that young people have in place in their school settings does that feel safe for them and if it doesn't what's um what's your internal backup plan and ideally you've got that backup plan before a young person has disclosed to you so that your organizations and the um the organizations you're working for having that conversation with the schools figuring out this this process you have in place for the young people in your schools isn't working for them. How can we support you to improve it? And, and I'm just wondering, Miriam, whether even to a nest is a, is a place where people can go if they don't have policies and procedures. Um, others do. So, yeah, so exactly. the most important one is to have one. And if yeah. you don't, then contact Miriam. You know, like there contact are places to go all. to get them. We'll connect you with who have them. Yeah. Um, the other really important piece is... Um, get to know as an individual facilitator your local crisis services because on the phone and the and get to know the national helpline give them a call yourself um, i used to get all of our facilitators do this at least once of actually experiencing calling them the helpline and talking to the person on the other side because then you know that uh, overcomes that barrier of actually asking help for yourself sometimes but also that there are a resource in the community if you're having a tricky situation in a school you've got obviously your line manager um, that you should be accessing but also you've got other community supports that you can access and you know thinking of the sexual harm crisis services in particular this is the, the this is what they do every day um, and so there's a wealth of experience and expertise that you can draw on um, and and don't have to feel that you do need to do this all by yourself. And what um, Jono was saying is absolutely essential is, um, and that connects to the trauma-informed care piece of trustworthiness and transparency. Um, before a disclosure, ideally a young person knows how you're going to handle it so that they can also make a choice um, whether they want to tell you or not. Um, because sometimes they might um, they might want to choose if they know what the process is going to be afterwards they might actually um, choose for their own wisdom and for what their needs are in that moment um, not to tell right now so that's kind of a summary of all of that now um, we are at the end of our session and I'm going to stop it there and just wondering if there's any final questions that people had before we close up today and hopefully we managed to cover enough and this was useful i did see that there was a question and um, so you can type them in the chat or in the q a um, there was a an interesting question around um stop like last time we i explained a bit roughly the um the friend response as a stockholm syndrome in terms of um especially having that kind of befriending someone who is in the adult um, sexual assault world um, where someone is being violent as a mitigate as a mitigation for violence. Um, do you have anything else you would add on that friend response and um, in that space? Um, I mean, I, I think that it that it's it's complicated um, because I think that there's there's the um, yeah it can be used in both those frames and I think just generally if we get a fright we've got our natural kind of response to that and that is to kind of look and socially orient. Um, but I suppose in a situation where there's been grooming and we're in a space of danger, then um, those natural responses don't um, don't disappear. We're going to continue to try and align with the person who's meant to be the one who's keeping us safe. So this is why incest and, and, and sexual harm within families, um, you know, can create so much so much harm because the person who was supposed to keep me safe um, is the person who's harming me. So imagine what a how confusing that can be to a brain and in fact we do we use whatever skills at our um, disposal to keep as safe as we possibly can mm. and, and, I think and that, that's that um stuff around trauma is that it is complex and it depends you know the how often the trauma has occurred by whom yeah. what other protective factors were occurring like even in the same family system was there another family member that actually had some level of protectiveness and um had that relationship so it's there's so many factors <laughs> that I suppose in a, in a very simple way of, um, you know, the, those are some, some common responses that happen within very specific 
context that will vary from individual to individual. Yeah, and, and ultimately, if, if you're someone who's not in a therapy role trying to tease this apart for that individual, because as you say, that, that's the key, and you're in an, an educational facilitation role, pretty much the message is um, you make sense. <laughs> and part of going to therapy might be to help you make more sense. Um, and to and even though you might make sense, some of the things you're doing might not be helping you so much. So again, that's where therapy might be helpful to kind of help you work out to, to, to um, yeah, so it's, it's digging deeper. But in your role, it might be that all you're saying is, hey, actually, whatever you're saying is making sense. Yeah. And I think that's, um, that's the interesting uh, continuum between intervention and prevention in terms of also understanding intervention as prevention at times. That yes. for some, the level of behavior change that is required to either um, no longer be harmful sexually or um, be less at risk of experiencing sexual harm, um, you know, that that might actually sit more in an intervention space than to thinking of the re-victimization and the steps, the information that we know around how if someone's experienced child sexual abuse, they're more likely to experience sexual violence in later stages of life. That's, I think, how preventionists need, this information is useful for preventionists to understand sometimes the limits of education only programs and where other types of strategies and interventions is really important and useful. I would say the, the one thing there for um, preventionists to know, especially in sexual violence education rather than um, psychoeducation, is to, to acknowledge for us that um, that's a normal response as part of the, the human brain and experience. Um, that friend might be a normal response for someone. So um, it's about normalizing and, and myth busting in that instance as well, that just because somebody has um, had that friend response doesn't mean that, you know, oh, well, that's your fault then. You know, you, you, you ask for all of the sort of stuff that we'd usually talk about around um, uh, what is essentially victim blaming mm -hmm. kind of mindsets. Um, so that's and, and, and the only thing I'd add to that then is that normal friend response might not actually be helping you now. Mm. So you yeah. might actually need to do have some therapy or some support around stepping out of that response and do something a bit differently. But the fact that you did it in the first place is yeah. not your fault. Yeah. It makes sense. So, so that's the bit about most of our responses worked for us at one stage. Yeah. And are I they working for us now? And I think that's just such a different level of interacting with people. They are really acknowledging, um, acknowledging people and their um, and their lived experience. Um, this one's a quite a complicated question, um, and I'll just see if we're able to wrangle it in terms of the impact of drug, alcohol, and drugs or other disorders like fetal alcohol spectrum disorder have on trauma education. And I suppose here it's also that distinction of are we talking about going and doing an education session with this population group or is it in terms of individual intervention? So those are kind of two separate things. Um, and, you know, what we should think about, um, sorry, and um, what should we think about these people receiving this information and how should we address the addictions and the disorder first or give them the psychoeducation, or should it go hand in hand? So it's quite quite a big question in some ways. <laughs> and I think it sits more in that kind of intervention clinical space, um, which isn't quite the, the theme of this presentation. Mm. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's yeah, it it's probably requires a bigger response, hey? And um, mm. I think that that's the bit where, um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> probably, probably requires a bigger response. <laughs> but um, do feel free to kind of email us and we might be able to put you in contact mm. with people that can actually answer that question more in depth and don't, no need to apologise. It's um, no, totally not at all. great questions to have. It's just trying to figure out um, where we go with that and how, how much of a can of worms we open. But the key thing is that there's probably people in, that we know in terms of Taunus that we could link you in with to actually have more in-depth conversations with. Um, cool. So we've put in the um, um, we've put, we've talked a lot today, and hopefully this has been a helpful session. And we'll wrap it up here. Um, and I know, and um, someone mentioned um, that an hour and a half is a bit way too short for these topics, which I find really interesting because we're. I, and I totally agree. These um, these have been such rich couple of webinars, and we've 
covered a lot of depth. So um, maybe if we ever do them in the future, we'll just need to do more of them, <laughs> spread them out over a longer period of time, or we actually might need to think at how else to deliver this information, because I think people have taken a lot out of it. But um, firstly, we would like to thank all of you who have been online for um, this hour and a half. It's been great to interact with you all. Um, hopefully you've, um, you've taken some stuff out of this and um, at least it's given you some ideas of things to Google, people to talk to, um, areas of personal and professional development to focus on in the next wee while. Um, and that's all we can really hope for. Um, are there any other final comments from uh, you, Jono, and then we'll go to Catherine. Um. I guess just that this is a, a, a really good start point for anyone who's kind of first coming into looking into trauma and trauma-informed practice. Um, so keep keep learning, keep developing and growing in this space. I know I'm constantly doing it. Um, and I want to thank you, Miriam and Tornest, for having us in the, um, in the space today. Um, and also, thank you, Catherine. This is the first time I've ever met Catherine. And... Um, I feel like I would like to go and spend a couple of hours picking your brain on stuff as well. Anytime. But thank you, everybody. <laughs> Catherine? Uh, I, I'd, I'd totally agree, Jono. It's been a really entertaining hour and a half for us, <laughs> yeah. regardless of who else is in the room. Yeah. Um, and and I think that, that for me as someone who um, works more in, well, you know, in the intervention space, the fact that there are people... Um, out there doing the prevention work and doing it so um, amiably and, and, and effectively and, and wanting to be informed about it makes our lives and the lives of our clients so much easier. It increases accessibility um, and hopefully means that some people don't have to walk, in, walk through our doors um, because they're learning some stuff. So um, whatever we can do to shore up and support the work that you guys do in classrooms and the conversations that you have, um, it's an absolute privilege. So um, thanks very much. And thanks, Miriam and Tornest. Oh, and thank you to you both. I, I have to agree. I, I love um, the conversations where we're weaving the partnership between primary prevention and intervention because they need to be in partnership um, and talk to each other and, and support each other and reinforce each other's work instead of feeling that they're separate. Um, and, yeah, I, I, I love hosting webinars and it's been actually a real joy presenting as well um because i i love training um so it's been a, a a real um it's been really beautiful for me to do these um two webinars together so um thank you to you both and um does anyone want to close in any particular way or cool so i will close this Unihia, unihia, unihia ki te uru tapunui, kia wātea, kia māma, te nākau, te tīnana, te wairua i te aratakata, ko i rā e rongo, whakairia a ke ki runga, kia tīna, tīna, huie, tai ki e. Kia ora koutou, everyone. Hopefully you all go well into the next stages of your day and have a wonderful weekend. This will get... Um, tidy up and um, put online on YouTube so it can be used as a resource for the future. Thank you to you both and we will talk soon. Kakite anō.